All right, well, we might get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Tracy Steinrecken. I'm the president of the Australasian Mycological Society, and I'm a postdoc at the CSIRO in Brisbane. Welcome to our first AMS virtual seminar for 2022. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land around Australia and New Zealand and around the world, uh, where we all meet them today. I am speaking to you from south of Maiwa River, the Brisbane River in Queensland, on the traditional homelands of the Yagara and Turbal people. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you for joining us today for the first seminar of 2022. We had a very successful seminar series last year with a whole array of mycological research interests from early career researchers to highly distinguished professors, curators, scientists and volunteers presenting. Our audience ranged across 12 countries with attendance ranging from 30 to 60 people per seminar. It's a really great way to get some of that research out there. This year, we hope to continue with this initiative. And as such, if you have uh, any research you'd like to share with us, please get in touch with us via the AMS website, which I will put up in the chat shortly. Our speaker today is Dr. Jonathan Clett. Jonathan is a counsellor on the AMS Council and a senior lecturer in plant microbe interactions at Western Sydney University. Jonathan did his PhD at Queen's University in Canada in the area of plant hormone perception and disease immunity. The aim of his current research program is to compare and contrast the genetic traits that underpin the relationships of the pathogenic and mutualistic microbes with their hosts. One of the key focus areas for Jonathan is the role of microbial signals in establishing and manipulating the outcomes of these interactions. He uses plant hosts from forestry and agricultural contexts, combined with their associated mycete, fungal and bacterial partners to tackle these complex questions. He specializes in combining a range of different techniques from molecular biology and biochemistry, including genomic and transcriptomic analysis, protein-protein interaction assays, enzymatic tests, as well as the creation and characterization of mutant organisms to achieve his research goals. If you'd like to ask any questions of Jonathan, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, or during the discussion, you can raise your hand by right-clicking your name in the list, and you can ask Jonathan directly. At the end of the talk, please take a minute to answer our three questions survey. But right now, Jonathan, you can take it away. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks very much, Tracy, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, it is really great to be able to kick off the year, um, to be able to start talking about some fun science um, in this type of forum and get feedback, um, which we always highly appreciate. So as Tracy introduced, I'm going to be talking about the work that we have been doing uh, in my group, looking at how mutualistic fungi today is what I'm going to stay with, um, how they are working together or manipulating, depending on how you're looking at it, uh, their hosts to achieve a symbiotic interaction. So from the perspective um, of what we're talking about today, um, I know I'm talking to a lot of people who understand fungi, in a lot of cases far better than I ever will. Um, but I thought I would take a couple of slides just to define what I mean um, by mycorrhizal fungi, since that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Also, for those of you who uh, might have heard a couple of my talks at the end of last year at um, FAOBMB uh, or at APPS, um, I am cognizant of that, and I have tried very hard to have minimal overlap um, between those. So today for mycorrhizal fungi, I'm talking about fungi um, that, as best as we can understand, have co-evolved with plants since they emerged onto land. Um, and since that time, uh, it's estimated that 50,000 species, if not far more than this, of fungi are able to form what's called a mycorrhizal association with plants. Um, in most cases, or in all cases, we would consider these to be a mutualistic interaction whereby both um, the plant and the fungus benefit, um, though under what conditions that occurs is still an open question. There are eight main types, um, if you read Smith and Reed 2008, that they usually talk about, um, with two main types of mycorrhizal fungi that have received the most attention to date. The first one being, of course, our vascular mycorrhizal fungi. These are the oldest um, known mycorrhizal fungi. And they also colonize 
almost everything, um, about 80%, if not more, of, of plant species, including major crop plants, annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, you name it. Um, and for this reason, they have received the bulk, I would say, of um, the attention, especially from molecular biologists like myself, um, because they are what supports what we eat. Um, so there's a lot known there about how they uh, colonize a host, um, what different nutrients that they provide, um, but there's still a ton of different great research that's being done um, in this area because the more we um, understand, the more we realize we've just scratched the surface. Lagging a little bit behind in our understanding, um, but still having a ton of great research being done around the world, uh, is looking at ectomycorrhizal fungi. Now, these are from the Basidia mycota and Aska mycota. They are much younger um, than our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. Um, they colonize most forest trees, um, a number of different shrubs as well. And as you can see between the last picture that I was showing you where, you know, you have this kind of beautiful tree-like shape, um, this is the hyphae of, of the fungus growing into a root cell. My ectomycorrhizal fungi, however, usually stay on the outside of plant cells, so they form this, this fat root looking like structure, um, which is mostly a mantle, which is a fungal mantle around the root. And it penetrates um, to certain varying degrees into the apoplastic space of the root, but it never penetrates into a cell itself. So those are, you know, a, a nice way of trying to differentiate between those two major types of fungi. Now, the central dogma around why ectomycorrhizal fungi are able to form uh, mutualistic symbiosis with the plant or with the tree um, is usually this idea centered around the fact that mycorrhizal, ectomycorrhizal fungi provide um, growth limiting nutrients that they mine from the soil to the plant in return for photosynthetically fixed carbon. Now, nitrogen as um, a nutrient benefit to the plant is something that there has been a lot of research on, um, though interestingly, it's actually been more of something that we've focused on more in the last 20 years or so. I was doing some research a couple of weeks ago looking into the early, the work done in the early 1900s, and actually they ignored nitrogen and they looked at phosphorus. Um, so there are a range of different benefits that these uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi can provide to the plant hosts, including other trace nutrients, protection from droughts, deaths, pathogen protection. Um, it seems nowadays, you name it, there's some aspect that they may support, um, but never under all conditions or very rarely under all conditions. And so that, you know, can lead into some interesting questions there. But sometimes, you know, as scientists, we like to have um, a bit of fun with this. And we like to think about, okay, well, you know, from a very human perspective, how, how do these relationships even start? You know, within the forest condition, you know, is there essentially a version of eHarmony that, you know, you might have a plant that, you know, puts out some kind of signal that says, hey, I'm an uncolonized tree looking for some love, um, looking to give some sugar in return for nitrogen or, or whatever different nutrient. And then it's responded to by the fungus saying, you know, dear uncolonized, we'll be perfect together, see you soon, just prepare a lateral root for me. Now, hopefully you get a bit of a smile out of that. Um, but it actually is something that increasingly, you know, obviously not in, in human terms, but it seems like there are various different signals that are passed back and forth between a tree and a fungus that might indicate, you know, just this, a receptive host um, seeking out um, a fungus to colonize it and vice versa. So first off, when we're looking for signals that may be defining this, we have to actually understand, you know, what's going on physiologically. So this is a very basic cartoon of what you consider as a transverse cross-section of the root. So if you imagine your finger and you were, you know, slicing like this, that is what we're looking at here. And we have um, in green the plant and you have the um, rhizodermis there, some cortex cells and, and the vasculature in the middle. And then in brown, um, you have the fungal hyphae that begin to aggregate on the surface of this root. So this can happen on both a receptive plant and, an, and a non-host plant. Um, but usually if it is a receptive or a host plant, over time this fungus is able then to grow into the apoplastic space as you see here. And then in a fully colonized root tissue, you would have a full mantle or a sheath um, of fungus surrounding that whole root. Um, and then the fungus also growing into um, this apoplastic space here. And it's at that interface between a plant cell and a fungal hyphae within this apoplastic space that you find nutrient transfer occurring. 
However, to go through all of these steps, you have a number of different things, especially on the plant side that have to happen. The plant has to lower its defenses. It has to be able to somehow recognize that this is gonna be a beneficial microbe um, and not try and kill it off. Um, you have to have cell wall rearrangement or softening of the plant to allow this fungus to penetrate into this apoplastic space. And finally, somehow you have to have nutrient flow that is organized between the two of them. So for the rest of today, I'm going to be talking about this idea of what kind of signals might be controlling, you know, these three aspects. But I throw around the term signal quite freely. Um, and it is something that different people will interpret differently. So I thought I might, you know, spend a little bit of time thinking about, well, what different types of signals might be, we be talking about? So we can consider that there may be volatile signals. So these are usually secondary metabolites or chemicals that are produced by a fungus or a tree um, that are um, not remaining in solution but go into a gaseous form. Uh, some of the main ones usually looked at are terpenes or some hormones like methyl jasmate or ethylene. Um, we can think about metabolites or RNA that are more soluble. So this can include nutrients as metabolites, defense signals, small RNA, we can also think of what we would term effector-like proteins. Now, if effector-like um, is a weird term to you, I will define that a bit later. Um, but today I thought we would look um, at a number of these um, and I'll give you some short vignettes as to some of the research that we've been doing in these areas and what they may be doing to start symbiosis or to stabilize symbiosis. The model systems I'm gonna be talking about today are almost all ectomycorrhizal. Um, because that's where our lab group works. The main uh, model system we'll be looking at is the fungus uh, Pyzolithus and a number of different species. Um, and the host uh, tree uh, is usually within the Myrtaceae. Um, and specifically, the main tree that we're using is, ecto, uh, is, ecto, is Eucalyptus grandis. Sorry, just because it has a genome, you can transform it, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. As a counterpoint, I'm also going to be talking a little bit about Lucaria bicolor. Um, it is found here within Australasia, but it is uh, mainly researched, actually, to my knowledge, um, in the Northern Hemisphere. And there it colonizes things like Douglas fir, um, poplar, um, and a number of other plants. So Lucaria bicolor is the main model system we started out understanding, but a lot of research has been done beyond that um, since then. So let's look at volatile communication first. So I'm going to focus today just on terpenes. Um, terpenes is a class of secondary metabolites that can either be volatile, so gaseous, um, or it can be soluble and just found um, within cytoplasm or exits. But I'm going to focus on those that are actually uh, found in gas form. And they're produced by a large range of fungi and plants. And eucalyptus especially is really cool in the fact that it probably has one of the most complex mixture of terpenes known to date in the fact that um, there are books written just about um, eucalyptus terpenes. Um, this is what makes koalas when they are eating um, different eucalypts um, look dopey because they're a bit high on terpenes. Um, so they're really interesting from that perspective. They're usually associated though with um, an aspect of defense. So terpenes are usually thought to be turned on within plants when they sense a pathogenic microbe. So that is where the vast majority of the research has gone is into looking how terpenes can um, fight off, for instance, myrtle rust um, or other things like that. However, when we started looking at ectomycorrhizal fungi, um, we ran into a slight issue. They make them too. Um, so why would a symbiotic fungus make a volatile that is known to induce defenses within plants? It doesn't really seem to make sense. However, when um, Frank and colleagues looked at this um, in 2015, they found that when Lucaria bicolor, remember that's an ectomycorrhizal fungus, um, the terpenes it produced seem to increase its host's ability to make lateral roots. So within um, the screenshots that are taken from uh, Frank's paper, you can see that when you have Lucaria bicolor present versus um, a control, uh, you can see that the number of lateral roots um, increases significantly. However, when you mix Lucaria bicolor with love statin, which stops the production of these terpenes, you lose that ability to produce those lateral roots. So this would seem to indicate that actually terpenes under some conditions may be beneficial to mycorrhizal fungi in the fact that they may increase the real estate or the lateral root 
uh, number that they would normally be colonizing. Now, as I said earlier, Lacaria bicolor uh, was used as one of the first model organisms to do a lot of this molecular research, but um, is it one of the only examples where terpenes might be beneficial? What happens if we look beyond that? So within fungi, there are five main classes of terpenes that are, are known to be produced based on sequence um, homology. And Lucaria bicolor um, is up here in group two, um, where almost all of its terpenes are found there, versus other ectomycorrhizal fungi like Pyzolithus, the one we mainly work with now, is found down here in group five. So because they have terpene sequences or gene sequences to make terpenes that are in different classes, are they actually making different terpenes? Could they be operating differently? So that was an open question that we decided to look at. So we cloned um, the terpenes from these two different species, Lacaria and Pyzolithus, and, and uh, expressed them in bacteria, which is a general workhorse for us, to try and identify what terpenes may be produced. And as you can see here in this graphic, um, in this stack chart, every single color is a different type of terpene that is produced. Um, whether in E. coli, whether it's producing um, a single terpene synthase. So these are three terpene synthases from Lucaria bicolor, and these are two from Pyzolithus. And some of the take-homes that we can have here is that even though um, these, based on sequence, are in very different classes, this was class three, this is class five, four, five, um, they have some degree of overlap in the terpenes that they produce. It's just the percentages and, and of types that they produce that look different. So we wanted to know um, what roles pyzolethus terpenes may be having in colonization of the host. And we ran some very um, similar experiments as to what uh, Frank de Tengu um, also ran. So we looked first at, at how this affect lateral rooting of eucalyptus seedlings. And we found that compared to when we had no terpenes, um, we had a slight increase in lateral rooting in eucalyptus, but it was not significant. However, with this slight increase in lateral rooting, we did find a significant increase in the number of lateral roots that were colonized. So these are the lateral roots that show that um, mantle-like sheath of the fungus. So this would suggest that um, terpenes are definitely being also a positive thing for Pyzolethus as they were found for Lucaria. When we looked at the ability of the fungus to grow into the apoplastic space of the root and form what's called a hardic net, we found, however, that there was no difference. So it really seems like terpenes, both in Lucaria, uh, bicolor, and in Pyzolithus, seem to be having some effect early on in, um, in colonization. So this would suggest there is a beneficial role. So we looked across um, colonization, and we decided to look at the expression of these terpene synthases, thinking, okay, well, they're beneficial. Obviously, they must be turned on. In science, that totally didn't happen. Um, so this is a heat map, and a very boring heat map, I must say, um, of all of the different uh, terpene synthases found within Pyzolithus microcarpus across a time course of colonization from presymbiosis through fully colonized root tips. Every white box that you see indicates a terpene synthase that was not differentially regulated. It literally was, it was doing nothing much. And the ones that show significant regulation are all blue, which means that they were actually turned off when the fungus actually encountered that root. So this would suggest that potentially, actually, rather than having you know, an, an effect later on once the fungus touches the root, that these terpenes could actually have most of their role pre-symbiotically. And this seems to be supported by other research done in very um, different uh, fields and the fact that um, soil-borne fungi that have been looked at with volatiles, these volatiles seem to be also directing root growth towards the fungus. So really it seems like these terpenes may be something that is necessary very early on to direct the root towards the fungus and also to potentially increase the number of lateral roots to colonize, but after that, the terpenes are not useful and they may be turned off. We also have protein communication. So this is where I'm coming to this idea of effector proteins. So if you're not familiar with what an effector is, what am I talking about? So effector proteins are a very specific class um, of proteins found in a range of different organisms, and they have a lot of different um, boxes they have to tick before we classify them as an effector. First off, they're usually small and they have to be secreted because an effector is usually termed as something that is a signal. 
It's encoded by an organism that is colonizing or making use of another organism. These proteins are usually what we would call an orphan gene. So this is only found in one species or genus. This, is an, this was found in the original definition of what an effector is. Now that we're sequencing more genomes, we're actually loosening the idea of, what, of this part of the definition because we're actually finding that some of these proteins are found in, in large numbers of different fungi. They have to be induced by host. If an effector is going to be in a protein that is helping signal or helping start colonization, it should be induced by the presence of a host. They have to shuttle between the colonizing organism and the host. There should be some form of receptor protein or target within the host that this, pro this fungal protein is affecting, and it should affect that host target. And then finally, if these effector proteins are actually something involved in colonization to signal it or stabilize it, if you remove these effector proteins or knock down their expression, you would imagine that you would also impede symbiotic colonization. These have been studied quite widely within um, the field of pathogenesis, also with, uh, within the area of a number of different insects. And these effectors, depending on the lifestyle of the pathogen, um, have been found to do different things. And these are just a few examples. For instance, if a pathogen is a biotroph needing a plant to stay alive to feed, the effectors usually somehow mask the fact that that pathogen is present so that the plant will not um, undergo localized cell death. On the other hand, if the pathogen is something that is a necrotroph and needs to feed off of dead tissues, usually these effector molecules actually induce an immune response and localize cell death so that the pathogen can feed faster. So this is where we mostly know our, of how these effectors work. And we asked back in 2008, which seems like yesterday, but totally isn't, um, whether or not mycorrhizal genomes would encode these effectors as well. So since 2008, we've sequenced a number of different genomes. The examples I'll have here are from 2015, but we recently released um, more recent papers in this area. But in every single mycorrhizal genome to date, we have found small secreted proteins that are orphan genes, so are usually restricted to one genus, that are induced by symbiosis. So you, know, you can have 10 or 20% of these orphan genes that seem like they might be these effector-like signals, so, so proteins that could be involved in signaling, manipulating a host to, um, to set up this, this mutualistic interaction. We have um, cloned a number of these sequences and tagged them with GFP because in order to understand what they do, we have to understand where they go. Um, so we found some of them are able to be taken up by the plant and localized to the nucleus. So in this picture, this is a triptych. Um, so you have um, the just look the GFP tagged um, secreted protein called a MISP on your left. Um, you have the plant uh, DAPI stained in the middle and then the merge on the far right. What you can see is that this protein has gotten into the cell and localized the nucleus. We have other um, effector proteins from mycorrhizal fungi that seem to stay within the cytoplasm and then yet more um, which don't get into the cell at all and remain extracellular. So this would indicate that different secreted effector-like proteins from mycorrhizal fungi are signaling agents, but they are signaling agents that have a multi or multi or different roles. Finding out what they do though is much harder than actually identifying where they go. And so to date only three have been um, characterized as to what they might target, um, not only where they go. And so I thought I'd take a few minutes today just to cover off on what they're actually doing. So MISP7 was the first ectomycorrhizal one that was found, and it was found to target jasmonic acid signaling. So if you're familiar with jasmonic acid signaling, um, the way it usually works is that in the absence of jasmonic acid, you have um, what's called a whole protein complex that you can see here all stacked up. What they do at this point doesn't really matter, um, but what we have here in blue is what is the receptor for the active form of jasmonic acid. And when jasmonic acid is not present, um, these, this whole complex acts together to repress jasmonic acid-inducible genes. However, when you introduce MISP7, which is the ectomycorrhizal fungal effector into the mix, it binds to this jasmonic acid co-receptor. It blocks its ability somehow to detect the fact that jasmonic acid is there, even when it is, and it maintains repression on jasmonic acid signaling.
And this is known to support root colonization. So MISP7 was really cool in the fact that it did get into a plant cell, it got to the nucleus, and it impeded this whole um, jasmonic acid signaling complex. At the same time, within arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, um, another protein called secreted protein 7 was also characterized. It was secreted from um, arbuscular mycorrhizal hyphae, got into the plant cell as well, and there it affected ethylene signaling to repress it. So like jasmonic acid signaling, ethylene signaling induces immunity usually. Um, and fights off fungal colonization. And so SP7 in its ability to turn off ethylene was really cool as well in the fact that it was manipulating the plant to allow colonization. More recently within Pisolithus microcarpus, we've identified another effector-like protein called MISP10, which um, once upon receipt of some single signal from the plant, again, we don't know what it is, it induces the production of MISP10 which is secreted into the apoplastic space, taken up into the plant cell, where it impacts this plant uh, enzyme called an adenosyl methionine deep carboxylase. And what this enzyme does is it produces um, higher order polyamines, which um, are known to facilitate or support mycorrhizal colonization. So again and again and again, we're finding that proteins are being used by um, ectomycorrhizal and mycorrhizal fungi more generally in manipulating their plant hosts to allow these first steps of colonization. However, you would think if these are so beneficial, um, we like to think of them as kind of like keys that unlock um, access to the plant, that they would be well maintained within um, different genomes of ectomycorrhizal fungi. It was a good hypothesis. Um, in the end, it actually turned out to be wrong. So in looking at Pisolita specifically, we've now been sequencing, I think we're up to nine or 10 different genomes now. Um, and when we look at just gene retention across those nine different species of the same genus, what we're actually finding is that very few genes are retained across all species, what we would call the core genes. And actually the vast majority of just gene coding space is actually specific to a species. So even though these are relatively closely related, um, they have evolved very quickly, far more quickly than we would have anticipated. And this actually carries across into the small secreted proteins as well. So this heat map here um, has a number of different layers of information in it. So across the columns, you have uh, five different species of Pisolithus. And within each row, that would be one secreted protein that we think might be an effector. So if you see a gray box, that means it is not encoded in that species. If you see a white box, it is encoded by that species, but it is not turned on or off by the presence of a host. If you see a red box, that means that it is induced by a host and it is present in the genome, and blue, it's present in the genome, but it is turned off when the fungus is colonizing. So if we found that these effectors for these protein-like sequences were um, well-maintained, we would expect to see this graph be a whole range of red. Instead, as you can see, it looks like a Sydney Pollock. It's, you know, colors everywhere, um, no real trends. And so this would indicate to us actually that these small secretive proteins have evolved quite quickly um, and that their roles may be um, very divergent or more divergent than we thought. And so this is leading us to questions now as to whether or not these effectors, if they are so important in communicating with the plant, are actually part of the reason why we see what we would call host specificity in different species of ectomycorrhizal fungi. So this is where, you know, one species can colonize one type of host, but not another and vice versa. So this to conclude this small subsection um, of my talk, mycorrhizal fungi are producing what we would call effector-like proteins to communicate with their plant hosts, um, and that these are manipulating their plant hosts in order to establish um, this symbiosis and potentially maintain, but we, we are not sure about that. But once, they, once these fungi have, you know, approached the plant and potentially signal vol through volatiles, after they have um, started to grow into this root, potentially using these effector like proteins, how is the fungus actually staying in there? What is actually stabilizing this interaction? And so that leads to the last two sections of my talk um, to look at signals that might be stabilizing this interaction. 
And the first one is looking at small RNA communication or micro RNA communication. And this is an area within our group that was pioneered by Joanna. Um, she came into our group um, to look at the uh, role of, of how small non-coding RNAs might actually be important. And the reason she was asking this um, is because as opposed to, you know, that initial dogma that we were taught in first year biology ages ago, um, to some of us in this idea that, you know, a gene always encodes an RNA, RNA always turns into a protein, etc. And that anything that doesn't have, you know, a normal start to a stop codon really isn't important. It's actually been found since then that um, plant genomes, fungal genomes, um, all encode what we call these microRNA or non-coding RNAs, which originally were, you know, annotated as junk DNA, but turns out that they have a very important role. So what they are is small non-coding RNAs that have small regions of them, about 20 nucleotides or a bit more, um, that are homologous or complementary um, to an actual coding gene. And when an organism wants to knock down the expression of a messenger RNA that has already been produced, um, there are a number of ways it can go about this. It can use RNAs to digest it, but that's not very specific. And so what has evolved within plants and fungi is this um, ability to produce these microRNAs, which form double-stranded um, RNA. Now, if you remember, double-stranded RNA is usually found within viruses. And because of that, plants and fungi um, have a system using argonaut proteins, dicer proteins, to destroy anything that is double-stranded RNA. So in these cartoons, you have uh, microRNAs being produced that form a double-stranded um, section here that is recognized within the plant or the fungus diced up, produces small, short, um, single-stranded RNA, which then floats around in the cell and by chance will bind to a target microRNA. Then again, the plant will say, oh crap, I have double-stranded RNA again and it will destroy this. But because it's destroying this, and including the, the messenger RNA, it's destroying that template, and so protein production is stopped. However, a number of years ago, we, um, in Haling Jin's lab in um, the US, they asked a very simple question that was really brilliant. They're small. Can these microRNAs actually be like an effector protein in the fact that they go into another organism and target expression of a gene there? So this is much like the idea of what I was just talking about with proteins, except at a, um, at a nucleotide level, whereby a small piece of RNA can get out of a cell, enter into another one, and specifically target um, a messenger RNA and its degradation to turn off that expression. So we sequenced Pyzolithus microcarpus looking for these small RNAs. We were successful in identifying 11 microRNAs, which were what we were most interested in which may sound to you within a genome that has roughly 20,000 genes to be relatively a small number, and it is, um, but this seems to be fairly normal within fungi. Um, they range, you know, between none um, up to maybe 20 or 30 microRNAs. So 11 seems to be right within that sweet spot. We did a time course to look at their expression across colonization. Um, and as you'll see here, um, there were a number of them that were induced by colonization. So this is presymbiosis through fully colonized root tip. And if it's yellow, that means that this microRNA was induced versus blue, it was repressed. Okay, so you can see that a number of them like near one, six, eight, ten, are all induced by the presence of a host root. But that just tells us the expression. It doesn't tell us where they are or what they're doing. So Joanna came up with this really brilliant way of looking at this, and she decided to say whether or not any of these microRNAs could be transferred from a fungus into the host. And she did this by growing the fungus and the plant separated by a membrane that doesn't allow physical contact, but allows all diffusible signals to go from one into the other. So in this case, it's the fungus growing on top of a membrane with the roots underneath. And then she extracted RNA from these plant roots, and then she asked the question, are there any Pyzolethus microRNAs recovered in this root? And of those 11, we found that four were, with MIR-8 being by far the one that was most concentrated within these cells. So we decided to follow up and, and um, understand a bit more what MIR-8 did. We used immunolocalization um, to identify where in a plant cell it might be. So this is our control photo on top where you're just seeing um, 
the root cells uh, with an with a scrambled probe, so you don't see any um, anything other than DAPI staining, which is in the purple here, pinky purple. However, when we use um, an antisense probe to identify where MIR-8 is that is tagged um, with a cyan fluorophore, you can see here these little bluey blue green dots. And so that is our Pyzolethus microRNA that is found within the cells of the plant. And this localization actually is reminiscent of where argonaut proteins and dicer proteins are found in cells. And remember, that is where microRNAs get chopped to bits. Okay, so this made a lot of sense and it was very exciting to actually see that we have a microRNA, something that normally you would think would be relatively unstable, that was somehow be secreted, get across into the plant cell and do something potentially of interest. But what is that rule? So we decided to vary the expression um, or presence absence of near eight. So under control conditions, this is what a eucalyptus colonized root system will look like. So this is a main root coming down here. And coming off the side, you have these very nicely colonized lateral roots that show that fungal sheath around them. That's why they're gold instead of white. However, when you inhibit the activity of near eight, you still get the formation of that initial sheath. But then what you see is white roots growing out of a number of these different fungal sheath um, uh, sections of the root system. So this would indicate that near eight actually plays a very important role in stabilizing um, that interaction between the plant and the fungus once the fungus has fully in, uh, encapsulated that root. But it still doesn't tell us what that microRNA is actually doing at the molecular level. So we sought to identify what the target of near 8 was. Now, thankfully, because this is working on the level of um, DNA or, or of RNA, um, as opposed to proteins, which I talked to you about earlier, the way it works is through complementarity, right? So you can just use a screen of complementarity of your near 8 sequence against the plant to try and identify putative targets. So that's what Joanna did, and she came up with three really high quality candidates. One was an NBARC containing protein, so these are usually associated with immune signaling, um, and the other two which were single-stranded DNA endonucleases. Now, what this graph is showing here is what happens to the expression of these three genes um, when we add more near 8 or when we um, inhibit its activity. And so what you would expect if near 8 is responsible for knocking down the expression of a gene is that the more you add, the less of the target gene you would find. And vice versa, if you inhibit near 8, you would also expect the more you inhibit near 8, the more of its target protein you would find. And so while we see that um, general trend across all three of these, it was most significant for the NBARC immune receptor. We looked at a few other genes um, that were um, close homologs of this one, and we found a similar pattern again, um, but not as significantly regulated except for one of them. However, in all cases, what this would suggest to us is that small RNAs or microRNAs specifically in this case can act as signals during active mycorrhizal symbiosis. And that near 8 specifically is able to again modulate immune um, perceptivity of the plant um, to try and stabilize the later stages of this interaction. So the final thing that I'd like to talk about with the last remaining uh, five or so minutes that I've got is this idea of nutrient stabilization and symbiosis. So this goes back to the very beginning of my talk and that idea that the whole reason we think that these symbioses um, are maintained uh, to date is this idea that there is nutrient exchange between the fungus and the plant that is mutually beneficial to the two of them. So that would mean that nutrients themselves are a signal um, and a signal that helps to stabilize symbiosis. And so um, Emmy Stewart has been a PhD in our lab and she has been really digging into different aspects of this. And I wanna look at just one small part of what her thesis has been about um, with relation to nutrients. And what it is, is it has been building off of work um, of Sarah Hortal, who used to work at Western Sydney. Um, and what Sarah had done was using some of the isolates of Pyzolethus microcarpus we have that have known ability to give nutrients to the plant. And so what Sarah asked was, what happens when you combine on one root system um, a helpful, we will put this in quote, 
um, isolate of Pisolates microcarpus, so SI9 in this case, that provides a lot of nitrogen to the plant. With Pisolates microcarpus R10, which is what we would call a cheater, in the fact that it takes a lot of carbon from the plant, but it gives very low to no nitrogen to the plant. So you can colonize Eucalyptus grandis with either one of these isolates in isolation, and they colonize very well. The plant seems to, you know, accept both of them. However, what's really interesting um, that Sarah found was that when you put them both onto a tree at the same time, what you find for R10 specifically is, as opposed to when R10 is by itself and colonizes roughly 40% um, of the root system, when you put it into competition with SI9, which is a bene more beneficial fungus, the plant is actually able to reduce the ability or produce the number of lateral roots that are colonized by this cheater fungus. And the way it does this, uh, we found, is probably because when R10 is present, um, you see this massive red here, um, it means that these genes have been induced and these genes are associated to defense. As opposed to when SI9 colonizes, most of these defenses are actually green, which is actually turned off. So that would indicate that the plant is actually able to identify that microbe that is not providing enough benefit and actually turn on a defense against it. So this argues again for nutrients being a signal to stabilize symbiosis. But how are the fungi actually getting those nutrients to be able to send them over and stabilize this interaction? So what has been known for a long time is that ECM fungi use different enzymes to liberate nutrients. And um, Emmy was looking here specifically at phosphorus, mm -hmm. not nitrogen. Um, and so what she found was, as opposed to when a plant is growing in soil by itself, as opposed to when it has either Pisolithus albus or Pisolithus microcarpus, you find that there's a significant increase in the, in the plant available phosphorus when the fungus is present. Okay, this makes sense, right? They could potentially, the fungus could be producing enzymes and doing this all by itself. However, when Emmy looked at the enzyme profiles um, of these two species of Pisolithus microcarpus in the presence of insoluble um, phosphorus. She found that some of them were induced, which is what you can see here with the little um, asterisks above them, but especially in microcarpus, not really doing much. It's not really doing much heavy lifting by itself. So that led to the question of when it's in soil, is it actually operating alone? Is the reason we're seeing liberated phosphorus in the soils because the fungus is doing it or because it's working with somebody else? And so we looked at the microbiome within the soil and we found something very interesting with relation to the bacteria. We found that Pisolithus was able to influence the bacterial microbiome and influence it in a non-random fashion. So I'm gonna show you a really uh, um, complicated figure, which I don't anticipate that you're gonna understand or read now. Please read Emmy's recent paper in this area. But the general overview of it is that when Pisolithus was present, we found um, as a whole that um, bacterial populations were increased and that they were also skewed to the fact that they were able to more likely use inorganic phosphorus, while the fungus was more likely to liberate organic phosphorus. So it seems like the fungus is actually um, manipulating the bacterial population in the soil, just like it's manipulating its plant host in order to carry out a function, as in to leverage nutrients. How do they do this? How are they controlling their plants? This is currently really an unknown within ectomycorrhizal fungi. Um, however, I'll go back right to the beginning and ask, could it actually be the same signals used to manipulate a host that are actually also being used as a secondary option to manipulate bacteria and other fungi? And the reason I'm curious about this um, was this beautiful paper published last year in November um, by Nick Snelders um, in Bart Thomas group showing that verticillium, in order to be an effective pathogen, actually uses effector proteins to manipulate other microbes around it to increase its virulence on the plant. So this is an open question within our lab that we're interested in potentially pursuing at some point in the future. So there I'd like to wrap up with a few of the take-home messages. Um, just to recap, volatiles seem to have a role, but they may be ephemeral. And this is interesting considering that they're actually quite energetically expensive to produce. Um, all symbiotic microbes to date seem to use a variety of microbes to communicate with their hosts. 
So that leads to a question of how does a plant in nature actually cope with all of these signals at once? And finally, nutrients are acting definitely as a signal to stabilize um, this interaction. But how is the fungus actually manipulating potentially the microbiome to help it um, get those nutrients in the first place? So this obviously is the work of a lot of different people. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge a number of them here, as well as the funding agencies that have been contributing to this. Um, and as well, if I can have just a two second plug, um, within our group, we have a postdoc position that will be opening up in the next month or so to look at um, more in depth at the role of the small secret of proteins of Pyzolethus. And we also have a PhD position opening up, um, looking more into pathogenesis um, of a crop plant um, and looking at how we can modify some of these signals um, to protect broccolini. And with that, um, I am happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was really interesting and a, a really great synthesis of a lot of um, important research and some great new research coming out. So thanks for sharing. Thank you. Um, I might kick off with my own question. Um, do you think it's possible to augment revegetated systems with microRNAs to encourage recruitment of mycorrhizal particles? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I think it. I think it bears trialing that, yes. Um, the problem always is, right, when you're dealing with soil is how do you get things into the soil, <laughs> right? I mean, this is the nice thing with, um, with trialing microRNAs, for instance, if you're talking about a leaf microbiome, you just spray a leaf, it's great. Um, getting something to actually penetrate and get into the soil is, is a bit more um, of, a, of a feat, I think, that we'd have to overcome first. So could it have a good impact within the soil microbiome? Definitely. How do we get it there? Could be a logistical nightmare. Yeah, absolutely. I guess if you're going to be germinating seeds at the start, you've got to get them in early and try and yes. vegetate with pre-mRNA or pre-microRNA plants. <laughs> yeah, well, there are, so there has been work within Australia, and actually Australia has been one of the leaders in this, and I think it's actually at CSIRO, um, where they've actually been able to bind some of these microRNAs onto clay pellets like Tiny, tiny tiny clay pellets and those you can mix into the soil um, and they find that they have a half-life of about 30 days which for RNA seems unbelievably long um, but so there are different uh, groups within Australia that are looking at this those are actually from the pathogen perspective they want to kill off pathogens but it's true that potentially we could actually think of it about it from a revegetation perspective and see if we could actually boost um, some of those initial native beneficials um, at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a few systems that could benefit from um, a bit of a, I guess, a, a booster. Um, for example, looking at the uh, Monero dieback situation and if it's a revegetation where new plants just topple over. So, I mean, I have a vested interest in that project. So, <laughs> it's not, full disclosure. But yes. um, yeah. <laughs> Um, have we got any other questions from the audience? Please feel free to use the Q&A function. Oh, here we go. Teresa van der Hull, she's asking, do you think that myxomyces would be involved within these uh, transfers? I must admit I'm not familiar with myxomyces. I would have to look into that. Teresa, that is a good wanna, question. Did you want to give a bit of um, more insight into that question? You want to talk? You want to just put your, your microphone on, you're welcome to do that. Sorry, what was that? Would you like to um, just give a bit, a bit more context to your question um, in terms of the mix of my seats? Oh, well, mix of my seats are microbial predators. Um, and they are responsible for many things that happen within the environment, including nitrogen and carbon dioxide sequestration. Um, they all this, well, they are what they are. They're microbial predators and they consume bacteria. Mm. I was wondering whether or not they contributed to this signaling that is going on with the, the fungi and, and the eucalypt. 
That's a really brilliant question. Um, we haven't looked that far, to be completely honest. Um, a lot of the work that I've been talking about um, is done in a one-on-one -on -one situation because it makes life so much easier. <laughs> um, Emmy is one of the first ones within our group that is actually taking that beyond um, and trying to ask within a within a more complex microbiome what's going on. And that's eventually where we want to go. Um, I can totally see that as an as a interesting possibility of if something consumes um, a microbe and is able to take it up and it doesn't digest, um, that it can poop it out and it could potentially act as a vector, definitely. Um, I mean, we've done work with, um, with nematodes and seen transfer, obviously, of, of nitrogen between plants. But yeah, I don't see why we couldn't see proteins and other stuff like that. I find that very curious. I'm going to look into that. Thank you for that suggestion. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Um, Dee is asking um, if the ECM fungus can turn off an effector, is there any risk that a pathogen could take advantage of this and colonize the plant? Mm. Yeah, you would think it would, right? I mean, the fungus is essentially turning off the immunity in an area of the plant. And it's a, it's a it's an open question at the moment as to how local if that's localized or if that's actually quite, you know, a long distance signal. Um, you would think it could be quite a long distance signal. And it's something that we've talked about in the lab of trying to figure out how far this this immune, you know, suppression actually goes. Is it systemic? Is it not? Um, so I would think that it could be, because when we've looked at the microbiome, um, especially of pine, of ectomycorrhizal root tips, we're finding actually um, sometimes a surprising amount of, of pathogen load within them. Not that we want to say that too far. Um, but, you know, and it could very well be this idea that they are taking advantage of some small part of the root in that case of getting in and being like, ah, <laughs> you know, I can colonize this aspect. Um, and take advantage of what the ectomycorrhizal fungi are suppressing. So I think that's definitely a possibility. Can they actually turn it off? That would indicate that they would need to know that a pathogen was actually present. Um, and I have not looked into, an, into that area of, of whether the pathogen would be detectable by the micro, ectomycorrhizal fungus. Um, so it would be something to, to look into, definitely. Um, another question coming up in the chat, um, and I forgive my my uh, pronunciation. You found uh, pisolipus increases the uh, pisolipus increases the beneficial bacteria in the soil. Could it also increase beneficial fungi? Probably, I think it would. Um, so we didn't. We looked at bacteria in that case um, because of the specific system we're working with. We only added in a, a bacterial wash. Um, so again, that leads to that, the question of complexity as you go on further. Um, what happens as you add more and more complexity? I think actually more likely that the fungi would have more of an impact on fun other fungi just because you know they're more similar, <laughs> um, same kingdom. Um, but exactly what that would be um, is an open question. Great. Um, and Evan John is asking, to what degree does deleting individual effector genes in the fungus reduce the ability to colonize the host? Is it likely to be a low or high number of genes required in an individual plant for microbe interaction? Um, surprisingly, it seems that you only need one lost to have a huge impact. Um, so MISP7, the first example that I gave you, um, when we used RNAi to knock it down. So we haven't been able to delete them yet, any of them yet. Um, we've only been able to use RNAi knockdown. Um, but for, in that case, when we knocked down the expression of MIS-7, we went from, I think 50 or 60% of colonized roots down to like 5%. And even those were pretty piddly. Um, so it was surprising that you just remove one of them um, and it you know, has such a stunning effect. Um, in other cases, we don't have as strong an effect when we've, when we've knocked them down. Um, but every single time, bar one, I think, that we've tested so far, and that's maybe of half a dozen, um, every time we knock it down, we, we lose symbiotic efficiency. So it seems to be highly uh, dependent on them, which then leads to that, you know, going back to the idea of how these effectors seem to be so very poorly conserved in between 
species that are closely related. You know, why would it do that? Why would it lose something that seems to be so um, necessary unless it's unless it's linked to host specificity? Excellent. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I think we're going to end the questions there. So to all of you for attending today, a uh, big thank you. And to our wonderful speaker, Jonathan, for a fantastic talk. Really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please take a moment, everybody, to answer the quick survey. It's only, it's only three short questions. Um, and don't forget that if you have research to share, get in touch and we'll sign you up to present your work at an upcoming seminar. Thanks very much. And we'll hopefully see you next time.